we get to uh, open up God's Word this morning in Luke chapter 9. And uh, so if you've got a Bible, I would encourage you to open it up. If you can open it up on your phone or however else we get God's Word. Um, Luke chapter 9, we're, we're going to be looking at verses 51 to 56. And uh, as you're turning there in your Bible, the, the most pivotal point in the entire gospel of Luke is right here, right here in chapter 9. This is uh, where so much of Jesus' own life and ministry hinges. Uh, it, it's a huge turning point in the gospel of Luke. And so uh, let me read it for us, and then I will pray, and uh, we'll get to work. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51. But when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he, that is Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, Do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. Let's pray. God and Father, we uh, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the testimony of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And we pray by the Spirit, through the Spirit, that... Lord, your, your word, which is truth, that it would refresh us today, that you would reveal yourself to us, reveal the grace that you have for us in Christ afresh, and uh, renew our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 51 says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. Okay, this here is... The, the days when Jesus would return to heaven. This is resurrection language. So he's talking about after his death, after his burial, after his resurrection. This is when Jesus ultimately would be taken back up to heaven where he had come from as God. It says, when those days were drawing near, he, Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay, so for Jesus, this is that day. This is the day when he turns his face to Jerusalem. Things take a turn in Jesus' life and ministry today. His mission is clear. His resolve is set. And his heart is strong. And he set his face to Jerusalem. And this is for the purpose of the crucifixion. Right? Right? Uh, That's what we're seeing here. Jesus, with firm determination, sets his sights ultimately toward the cross where he's about to go to atone for the sins of the world, dying in our place for our sins as our Savior and our God. This is a huge point. So up until this point in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has been traveling uh, throughout Galilee. He's been preaching and teaching. He's been calling disciples to himself and sending them out. And... uh, at times, he's got an entourage with him of perhaps up to even 100 people. And they're traveling with him, this, this huge group. And all the while as they travel, you know, Jesus is healing, he's teaching, he is loving all kinds of different people. And what he's doing as he's going is he's announcing that the kingdom of God is near. But today, Jesus is going to start to march literally toward Jerusalem towards the cross, into harm's way, behind enemy lines to do battle with Satan's sin and death, to defeat, to disarm, and to destroy his great foe and our greatest enemy. And in the Gospel of Luke, if you continue to read, he's not actually going to arrive in Jerusalem until chapter 19. So he's got loads of time here. We've got 10 whole chapters from this point where he sets his face until he actually arrives there. And in that time, there's lots for Jesus to do. But in the midst of all of it, what Jesus is doing is he has set his face towards Jerusalem where 
he's anticipating his coming execution by crucifixion. So the whole tone and tenor of his ministry changes at this point. The whole tone and tenor of the Gospel of Luke changes at this point. Now, up to this point, uh, most of Jesus' ministry has been up north near the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so what he's doing as he's coming down towards Jerusalem is uh, what you would have to do, anybody traveling in that area, you would have to either make the choice to go through a place called Samaria or go around it. And most Jewish people in Jesus' day would choose to what? Go around it. And the the reason is that the Jews were not exactly friendly with the Samaritans. Uh, But Jesus goes right into Samaria. Straight in. No hesitation. That's that's Jesus. He is constantly loving all the wrong people. It's one of the things I love about him. And in verse 52, we see that before entering this Samaritan village, what Jesus does is he sends messengers ahead of him to go and make preparations for him, right? And so uh, this shouldn't be surprising to us, right? Many of these towns and villages that Jesus would have traveled through, they would have had, um, you know, dozens, maybe a few hundred people. These were not cities the way we would think of them. We're, We're talking towns or villages, uh, a few hundred people at most, and we're talking farmers, fishermen, you know, hard-working, blue-collar people. And, uh, and Jesus shows up in some of these towns and villages with a retinue of upwards of 100 people with him, right? You, do you see the challenge for these towns, right? This is a day when there, there are no all-you-can-eat buffets to bring your, your party to. There's no Costco, right? Uh, there, there's, no, uh, there's no Howard Johnsons to check into for all these people, no. And so these messengers would go before Jesus into these towns and say, hey, Jesus is coming, and uh, like there are a lot of us with him. And so, you know, is there going to be enough food? Where can we sleep? Are you able to accommodate us? And this particular town of the Samaritans says no. And the question is, Do they say no because there are too many people? It's not what Luke says. Do they say no because they don't have enough food or because there's no lodging? No, Luke tells us why in verse 53. He says, it's because Jesus' face was set toward Jerusalem. That's an interesting detail. And, uh, And here's the thing about Samaritans and why Jesus going to Jerusalem was such a big deal. Uh, The Samaritans were like Jewish people, but only kind of, only kind of, right? Uh, It's a little bit like the way that the CFL is like football, but only kind of, okay? Uh, If you don't know, the CFL has its own rules, its own number of downs, its own field size, and so when you watch a CFL game, there's an awful lot that you're watching that looks like football, but it's actually a very different game. It's a different game, right? That's the Samaritans. They had their own Bible. They had their own theology. They had their own temple for worship, and they even had their own mountain, okay? Uh, uh, How many of us have heard of the first century Messiah named Dosithius? Zero people, right? That's because he made zero mark on history and accomplished nothing. But he was the Samaritan's Messiah, well known as uh, who they looked to, okay? So basically, the Samaritans were a cult. And uh, as an offshoot from Judaism, the Jews didn't exactly know what to do with these people. They, they looked a little like us, but they're very different. Something is, whatever's happening on the field is very different from football when you start to play, see? Okay, today they would be like, uh, they'd be like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They'd be like people who talk about Jesus uh, with Christian language and in a Christian way, but when you dig down, you find out that they have their own very different Jesus, their own different Bible, their own way of worship, their own salvation, their own theology, right? It's a, it's a different game that's being played. And so when Jewish people traveled from up north in Galilee down towards Jerusalem, they would cross over the Jordan River and they would take an alternate route around Samaria to avoid these people. 
And there was intense hostility, actually, between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Uh, they hated each other, and they fought a lot. At times, they would even go and desecrate one another's temples. It's like the ultimate offense. The ultimate offense. They'd say things like, your Bible is wrong. No, yours is. Your theology is wrong. No, yours is. You know, your way of salvation is wrong. No, yours is. It was just, it was just a mess. This big, hostile mess in the relationship between these two groups. And notice what Jesus does. He doesn't cross the Jordan. He doesn't walk around Samaria. He goes straight in. And he sends messengers ahead of him to prepare the way. And when they get there, the Samaritans say to them, no way, no how. We don't want anything to do with Jesus if he's headed to Jerusalem. Okay? We have nothing to do with Jerusalem. And so if Jesus is going to come here and he's not going to validate us and our theology and our worship and our way of doing things and our temple, then we don't want him. See, the, the Samaritans were, uh, they were a religious group. They were a political group. They were a social group. They were a cultural group. And what the Samaritans stood for was their camp, their tribe. Our way is the best way. And they're... They were like many people today, many, many people today who have their whole identity wrapped up in a particular camp or tribe. And the thing about Jesus is that he's God, and so he doesn't join our camp or belong to our tribe. Uh, he doesn't follow us. We follow him, right? But the Samaritans see Jesus, and they see that he's going to Jerusalem, and they say, like, he can come here if he switches teams, sure. But if he's going to insist that Jerusalem is the place where God is going to continue his redemptive work, then we don't want him here. And so instead of repenting of their false worship and their false theology, instead of repenting, they reject Jesus. And those are the two options, really. Really. We have the option to repent or reject Jesus. He's very polarizing. And the Samaritans chose rejection. They chose wrong. They put their camp, they put their tribe before Jesus. They're willing to have Jesus so long as he played according to their rules, but he won't. And so they reject him. And my question is, what is your camp? Who is your group? What is your identity? Is it family? Is it race? Is it a political persuasion? Is it a particular identity that you hold? Is it your spiritual experience or your sexual orientation? What, what is your camp or tribe? As long as Jesus supports your cause and your camp and your tribe, you're cool with Jesus. But if Jesus would call you to repent, that he would call you to give up your mission or your identity or your community. Then all of a sudden, you're no longer cool with Jesus. This is how so many people in our culture, even some people in our churches, operate. We want Jesus to endorse our camp on our own terms. And Jesus comes to us and he says, no, I'm God. I don't join your team. You join mine. I don't endorse your mission you get on board with my mission. I don't follow you. You follow me. And the thing about Jesus' team is that he actually invites all kinds of people to follow him. It's very exclusive in that you've got to follow Jesus. But because it's all about Jesus, it's the most radically inclusive group of people that you could ever get. Because it's no longer about your tribe. It's no longer about your camp. It's no longer about your political persuasion or your sexual preference or anything. All of that goes by the wayside and Jesus becomes the center. And so he can invite everybody in to follow him. Different races and languages and nations and cultures and education and experience and socioeconomic backgrounds. All kinds of people 
are invited onto his team, but he doesn't join anyone else's team because he's God. He's God. So, what if Jesus doesn't support your lifestyle choices or your cause? What if he doesn't support your view of culture or your sexual orientation? What then? What if Jesus says you need to put me before your camp? You need to lay that down and follow me and start over. Would you be willing to receive him? Would you be willing to follow him? Or would you reject him? That's the way that it works. And that's what we see here in Samaria. They're like, he's going to Jerusalem and he wants us to follow him. We have a totally different agenda. We have a totally different ideology. He's asking us to submit to him? No. He can leave. And what the Samaritans choose is that they lose out on the blessing and the privilege of friendship and fellowship with Jesus. And what we see here is that God came to earth. He walked into Samaria, the very people that his people hated. He extended a hand of friendship to them. But because he refused to play by the rules, they rejected him. He was headed to Jerusalem. So the question I have for us is, how will you respond to Jesus? How will you respond to Jesus? I'm not only talking about whether you're a Christian or not. Right? I mean, today, tomorrow, the day after, how are you going to respond to this Jesus? Are you going to respond to him by following him as your king, as your Lord, on his mission and by his mandate? Or are you going to take your own way, build your own kingdom? your own mission, your own identity, right? The Samaritans rejected Jesus instead of repenting to Jesus, and you and I face the temptation to do the exact same thing every single day of our lives. Is it going to be my kingdom come, or is it going to be your kingdom come? That's the question. And so that's the Samaritans, right? We have a short passage here today, and they're actually just the first group to blow it in the passage, Okay, that's the Samaritans. The second group gets it wrong too, and, and these are not the enemies of God's people. These are Jesus' disciples, okay? I love how this story sets it up so as to, you know, for all of us to see how Jesus is really the, the one who is right and good and gracious, and everybody else has just blown it. It's great. Uh, the in crowd and the out crowd, in other words. They're both wrong. Um, so... So here, verse 54, Um, James and John say, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume these Samaritans? And James and John are those guys, right? These are the uh, turn or burn guys, you know. Uh, You Samaritans are not going to be on our team? Well, you know, bring on the fire. (laughs) You're going to reject us? Okay. Do you remember Jesus' nickname for James and John? Great nickname. Right? The Sons of Thunder. I love that nickname. Right? So, are these guys patient? Not really. You know? Are they loving? Not very. Does Jesus put them in their place? Yeah, like over and over and over again as you read. You know? And I, I got to tell you, one thing I do like about these guys is they don't lack confidence. You know, uh, they, they just think, hey, uh, we can just call down fire from heaven, which is like, that's kind of a big assumption. You know, uh, they don't even say to Jesus, hey, we think you should call down fire from heaven. They're like, no, no, we got this. <laughs> right? It's, they, they're, they're bold, these guys. They're like, Jesus, give us the go ahead and we will take care of this. The old fire from heaven tactic. And uh, now this, this may seem strange to you, that the, the response would be to call down fire from heaven. But it's, it's not completely random, right? James and John are Jewish people who are steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. And so they have a story in their heads that comes to them from the Old Testament, right? In, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 1, there is this prophet named Elijah who 
also gets into it with the Samaritans. Okay? And guess what their fight was about? Elijah versus the Samaritans. The fight was about the Samaritans rejecting the real God and trying to find salvation their own way. What's this story in Luke about? The Samaritans rejecting God when he shows up and attempting to find salvation their own way. So, so you see how these stories rhyme, right? And what happens with Elijah is that he confronts his Samaritans and he gives them bad news that they don't want to hear. And so the Samaritans send soldiers to try and capture Elijah. Right? They're like, we don't like what you're saying. You're done. Here are the soldiers. And what's Elijah's response to them? Well, he calls down fire from heaven and it consumes them. Okay? You see the rhyme. And so back to our story, James and John, they're thinking, these Samaritans haven't changed a bit. Right? They still want God to validate their false worship. They still want God to do their bidding. Well, if Elijah called fire down on them back then, we'll bring on round two. This is what they're doing. And what the disciples didn't realize is that Elijah's ministry and Jesus' ministry were two very different ministries. Very different ministries for two very different times. Elijah in the history of Israel, is a prophet of war. He goes to contend against the false gods to renew and restore Israel's worship. He is the prophet of war. And James and John mistake Jesus for being like him. Jesus, when are you going to come as the king of war? Let's call the fire down. Let's renew Israel. Let's get the false gods out of here. But Jesus doesn't come here as the king of war. He comes here as the king of peace. He will come as the king of war, but that's later. That's later, right? Now, Jesus comes first with great patience. He comes first with mercy. He comes first with grace. And so Jesus rebukes them. He's, he's like, hey, sons of thunder, just simmer down a little bit. Calm down here, right? And what he's saying is this. He's saying it's not the time. It's not time. There is a season for condemnation and judgment. There is a season, and that's coming, but that's not this time. He says, look, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going on a cross. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to atone for sins. You guys, I will send you back to Samaria later to say that I've atoned for sin. I've conquered sin. I have forgiven sin, and I've defeated death through my resurrection. It's not time for fire from heaven. It's time to give the Samaritans another opportunity to receive grace and mercy and forgiveness and salvation. That's the time. And this is the takeaway for us here and now, is that as long as there is breath in your lungs, it's the time. It's the time for salvation. The Samaritans blew their opportunity to receive Jesus here. But Jesus is not put off. He is going to go. He is going to atone for sin. He's going to be patient with them, just like he's been patient with us. Right? Just like he's been patient with James and John. He's really patient with us. And it doesn't mean that we should be lazy or not have any sense of urgency. We should. We should lay down our pride immediately. We should repent of our sin immediately. We should receive Jesus immediately. Put our faith in Jesus immediately before it's too late. But the, the time is, if there is still breath in your lungs, then it's not yet time for fire from heaven. See? Now, that doesn't mean that there won't ever be time for judgment. The, the Bible is clear that once somebody dies, there is fire, right? Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed for man to die once, then what? Then comes judgment. Then comes judgment, right? It, when you die, it's over. That's it. Th nothing more can be done. And so there is a sense of urgency. The, the time is now to choose. There will be a time when you're judged, and it's heaven or hell. That's the way it is. That, that is how God's economy 
works. There's no reincarnation. There's no second chance. And so have a sense of urgency, unlike the Samaritans. But as long as you're alive, it is not yet the season for condemnation. There's still the invitation to salvation in Jesus. And here's why. He is heading to Jerusalem to take the fire from heaven that we deserve. That's the whole point. He is heading to Jerusalem to take what we deserve. That's why Jesus can be so patient and so gracious with us. When James and John ask Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven to consume them, Jesus rebukes them, but he doesn't rebuke them because their understanding of sin and its consequences is wrong. That's not why he rebukes them. He doesn't rebuke them because there's no fire from heaven. Jesus rebukes them because he knows the fire is coming down on him so that it wouldn't come down on us. Jesus' patience with us is because of his great sacrifice for us. He is patient with us because of his great love for us. And this is Jesus' response to the Samaritans who reject him. This is Jesus' response to the people who hate him, who try and insist on their own way, who are stubborn and obstinate and hard-hearted towards him. This is his response to people who demand that he affirm their lifestyles and join their tribe. He lovingly sets his face toward Jerusalem to be crucified in their place for their sin as their substitute and savior. And so my final question for us here today is, do you see yourself in the story? If Jesus took the fire for you, for your salvation while you were still his enemy, then how are you going to respond? How are you going to respond when people reject you? How are you going to respond to people in other tribes who belong to other camps with different ideas and different theologies, and different orientations? Do you love the lost like Jesus loves the lost? Or do you simply want to call down fire on everyone who disagrees with you? Are you patient with others the way that J Jesus has been patient with you? Do you care about the hundreds of thousands of people who call this island their home and who don't know Jesus, don't care about Jesus, and who are being swept up into lesser missions and temporary causes? I am utterly convinced that God has put us here in this city for a reason, with a mission and a purpose and a message. And it's not about how we're the good people and the world is all the bad people and all the bad people need to become like us. The message is like the one Luke sets up. There's Jesus and there's everyone else who's blown it. Whether you're on the inside or the outside, you still need Jesus. You still need his grace, his patience, his mercy, his forgiveness, just like everyone out there. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus alone is awesome. Jesus alone is good. Jesus alone has done for sinners like you and me what we never could have ever, ever, ever done for ourselves. So how should we respond? The time for salvation is now we have one life to live. The time to be a redemptive presence in our city is now. Our neighbors have one life to live. It's time to love them and point them to Jesus now. It's now. So think with me. How has God gifted you? How has God uniquely placed you in this city, in your community, 
among your neighbors and coworkers to advance his redemptive mission in this city? What resources has God given you? What gifting has the Spirit given you? What community of believers around you has he given you to partner with and pray with and pour? Who around you at work, at home, in your neighborhood, on your sports teams, whatever, who around you needs to hear about Jesus today and the hope that you have for eternal life that can only come through Jesus? Who around you needs to hear that? Who are you praying for? Who are you investing in? See, we have an opportunity with the gospel to give people eternal hope and eternal life. So who gets invited to your dinner table? Right? What a privilege it is to be able to receive the kind of love that we have received from Jesus and then to turn around and love others with the same love with which he has loved us. And comfort and hope and grace and forgiveness. What a privilege. Let's not keep these things to ourselves anymore. Let's partner together. Let's pray together. Let's be together. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. Left to our own devices, we are either like Samaritans or like James and John. And uh, we need your grace. We pray that you would forgive our sin. We pray that you would renew us in the image of Christ. We pray that you would move us by your spirit to do things that uh, seem crazy to many people in our city. And yet we know are rooted in love, talking about Jesus, being in awe of Jesus, pointing everyone to salvation in Jesus. We ask that you would do that work in us, through us, for our joy and for the good of our city. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.